the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty Ohio Silver, the Lone Ranger. and resourceful mask rider of the plains led the fight for law and order in the early western United States. Nowhere in the pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice. Return with us now to those thrilling days of yesteryear. From out of the past come the thundering hoofbeats of the great horse Silver. The Lone Ranger rides again. Come on, Silver. Let's go, big fella. Oh, Silver. At the end of the Civil War, General Jubal A. Early was as fiercely rebellious as ever. Though his commanding officer, General Lee, had surrendered at Appomattox, Early refused to give up the fight. To escape capture by federal soldiers, he disguised himself as a farmer and headed west, hoping to join General Kirby Smith's Trans-Mississippi Command. But before Early reached him, Smith surrendered. Steady down. Get up there. Come on, get it. Rather than do the same... Old Jubal headed for Mexico. Had he suspected that a small group of Confederate veterans shared his hope of continuing the struggle from the Southwest, Jubal A. Early might never have left Texas. As old Jubal crossed the Rio Grande, an ex-Confederate officer named Ross Colburn was on his way to his ranch in Texas, not far from the town of Muljaw. Ross was only 32 years old but his years of hard fighting and privation with Mosby's Rangers had left their mark in the grim lines of his hunger-pinched face. His faithful horse, Wonder, also showed the strain of the heartbreaking campaign. The half-starved animal was beginning to regain some of the flesh he had lost in the last terrible year of war. For on the trip home, Ross had paused as often as possible to let Wonder graze. They were approaching a fork in the trail when Ross saw three horsemen riding toward him. As they came closer, he recognized the riders. He waved and shouted, Rex! Bernie, wake up! Three ragged veterans named Bernie Ladner, Rex Quinn, and Waco drew rein. Separated since the start of the war, they dismounted, shook hands, slapped each other on the back, and exchanged warm greetings. No, go on it, Ross. You changed considerably. So <laughs> you, Waco. Where'd you get all that gray hair, Ross? Oh, <laughs> the Yankees gave it to me. They gave me a bullet at Chancellorville. But I was lucky it hit me in the shoulder where it didn't do any permanent damage. Yeah. There's been plenty of permanent damage done around here. You been home yet, Ross? No, I'm on my way to the range now. Yeah. You'll find your stock scattered all over Texas. Even if you're lucky enough to round it up, you needn't waste time trying to sell it. Unless you're satisfied to collect five Confederate dollars a steer. Confederate dollars? It's the only kind of cash in these parts. Not that it's good for anything but souvenirs. Things are bad in Texas, Ross. They could be worse, Rex. What do you mean, worse? I talked to a lot of people on my way here. They told me what the situation is. I came back because this is an ideal base of operations. 
What kind of operations? Fighting operations. But we're surrendered, Ross. We surrendered because General Lee had no choice. Our boys had been marching for days without food or rest when the showdown came at Appomattox. The horses and men were too starved and worn out to fight that day. But there'll be other days. But General Lee surrendered. Now look at the surrender as a temporary truce. Truce? Thunderation. We were beaten into the ground. We were outnumbered, outsupplied. But we weren't outgeneraled or outfought. Even with better weapons and ammunitions than we had, the Yanks didn't put up a better fight. Man for man, we could have whipped them if we'd had the food to keep going. Yeah. Well, it's over now. Not for me, it isn't. Huh? What do you mean? Now, for a lot of other veterans I've talked to on the way here, we'll fight again. With what? A guerrilla force to harass the Federals. When we've built up an army large enough to do some real damage, we'll go to one of our generals and ask him to take command. But you'll need weapons, ammunition, horses, food. You can't get those without money. Rex, do you know what a steer's worth in northern markets? No. It'll bring $40 in hard American cash. $40? $40 a head? That's right. And the people in the north will buy as much beef as we can deliver. Well, you know, I aim to deliver that beef. I'll use all the cash I can accumulate to buy what we need. Are you boys willing to throw in with me? Well, gosh, I'm game, Ross. So am I. Count on me. Good. We've got a lot of hard work ahead of us, boys. But we'll be working for the South. For the Confederacy. Ross and his friends found other young veterans to help round up cattle enough to begin the ambitious drive to the north. At length, they were ready to start. The drive progressed without interruption until it reached Kansas. There, the Texans were stopped by the fences of farmers who refused to let the cattle cross their land. It was late at night, and the full moon shone brightly on the campfire, where Ross, Rex Quinn, Bernie Ladner, and Waco sat making plans. Waco was cleaning his gun, and he looked up from his work to say, uh, uh, I don't know about you, fellas, but I'm not turning back to Texas with these steers. I'm Me going to straight through. Maybe those Southbusters don't have anything but gunplay. If so, let's do a talking with lead. We've tried everything else. Hey. Two riders ahead in this way. Probably a couple of the boys come to see if we figured a way to get past those fences. Oh, they're not our boys, Rex. They're coming from that homestead. They're riding good horses. Great day, Ross. One of those fellas is mad. Well, well, right, Waco. Cover the boys, right. The Texans didn't know that the masked man was the Lone Ranger. Expecting trouble, they held their guns steady as the tall stranger and his Indian companion drew rein at the edge of the firelit clearing. Oh, 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 yes, covered, mister. So I see. Who's the leader of this cattle drive? All four of us are leading. If those sodbusters think they can scare us off by sending a masked man or redskin to palaver with us... Is it customary for men from Texas to draw guns without cause? That mask is cause enough. How do you know we were from Texas? A homesteader named Ned Morgan told me. He also asked me to tell you that you may drive your cattle across his land. What did you say? If you'll come with Todd and me, we'll take you to Morgan. What, well, Mr. Dog? What we'll doing? go with you, mister. But if it's a trap... It isn't. And we'll soon know whether it is or not. Come on, boys. We'll see if there's anything to this masked man story. Later, Ross, Rex, Bernie, and Waco were in Ned Morgan's small cabin. With Morgan were two other homesteaders who agreed to let the Texans cross their land. Ross Colburn thanked them and said, There's just one thing I don't savvy, Morgan. You and every homesteader around here were dead set against letting us through. What changed your mind? The masked man who brought you here. Uh, uh, what did he have to do with it? Well, he's helped us several times. So we're under obligation to him. What's that got to do with us? Well, when he found out that your drive was stopped, he pointed out the fact that Hank and Mark and I didn't have any crops planted. He talked us into taking down our fences and letting you through our land. We're down right obliged to you, Morgan. Yeah, if there's any way we can repay you. Don't thank me and my friends. Thank the masked man. But why did he want to help us? I don't know. The next time you meet the Lone Ranger, ask him. The Lone Ranger. That was the first time the Texans met the masked man. But they were destined to meet again. The drive was completed. And on the return trip, Ross and his friends reached an agreement with the homesteaders. An agreement that would permit them to cross the farmland at a later date. They used the profits from the drive to buy guns, ammunition, horses, and supplies. 
and concentrated on accumulating more with which to finance their plans. After several other drives, their activities finally came to the attention of federal authorities. Messages concerning them were flashed to Washington. Agents were sent to investigate the situation. And when they returned to the Capitol, they reported directly to the president. The result was an immediate summons to the governor of Texas. The governor hurried to Washington. And on his return home, he stopped briefly at the ranch of Clarabelle Hornblow. When he left, Clarabelle and Thunder both knew that the governor wanted to see the Lone Ranger. Several days later, the masked man and his Indian companion stopped at the ranch. As soon as they entered the house, Clarabelle told them of the governor's visit. The Lone Ranger and Tonto swung to the saddle and headed for the governor's residence. After two days and nights of steady travel... They drew rain in the darkness a short distance from the official mansion. Hello, you stay with the horses. I'll go the rest of the way on foot. Me oh, savvy. Hey, wait here, Kimasabi. Good. I'll see you later. Keeping to the shadows to avoid being seen, the Lone Ranger made his way to the French doors of the governor's office. Looking inside, he saw that the official was alone. He tapped on the glass softly. A moment later, the door opened. Well, it's you. Good evening, Governor. Come inside, please. I must talk to you. The Governor drew the office curtains, then took another... Please, sir, came from Washington. The President himself entrusted them to me. Then you've been to Washington? Yes. I was sent for because a group of veterans here in Texas are organizing an army to continue the struggle against federal authority. Oh? Who's leading the army? Fogo Confederate soldiers. A Ross Colburn seems to be the leader. He was with Colonel Mosby's Virginia Cavalry during the war. Mosby's Rangers, huh? Yes. Bernard Ladner was an artillery man in the Army of Northern Virginia. Rex Quinn... He is one of the few survivors of Jackson's famous Stonewall Brigade. And a man named Waco rode with Jeb Stewart's cavalry. Government agents investigated all of them. Here are the reports. Colburn, Ladner, Quinn, and Waco. Hmm. You know them? Yes, sir. We met some time ago when they were driving cattle through Kansas. They've recruited nearly a hundred men. They've accumulated guns and ammunition. Almost enough ammunition to attack a federal garrison. If they do that, they'll get more guns, more ammunition, supplies, and... But, sir, I needn't tell you that that must not happen. If the president is aware of the situation, why doesn't he send troops to disband the army? That's the very thing he wishes to avoid. Why? For a very commendable reason. To disband them by force would accomplish the immediate purpose. But it would do nothing to erase the hatreds that resulted in war. Unless those men voluntarily accept our flag as their flag, we can never hope for real peace and unity. The curtain falls on the first act of our Lone Ranger adventure. Before the next exciting scenes, please permit us to pause for just a few moments.
to continue. The Lone Ranger listened soberly to the governor's account of the problem that might result in the resumption of hostilities between the North and South. Those armed veterans must disband willingly, disarm, and return to their homes. What can I do to help, sir? I'm authorized to ask you to act unofficially for the government. If you're acquainted with Colburn and his friends, you may be able to persuade them to give up their plan. I don't think that's possible. Uh, what? I haven't that much influence with them, sir. You could reason with them. Do you think that would change their loyalties? But he confounded it. There must be a way short of bloodshed to stop them. I told the president you were the only man who could do it. Only one man could do it. But if you can do it, who can? Robert E. Lee. The, the commanding general of the Confederate forces? Yes, sir. You expect him to persuade Confederate soldiers to abandon their plans? Yes, sir. But he represents everything they fought for. He's the greatest rebel of them all. He's a great man. I think he's a great American. He's a paroled prisoner of war, sir. Governor, will you give me a letter of introduction to General Lee? You are counting on his help? I'm going to ask for it. I'll give you the letter. But I shall be sorry to report to the president that we have failed. Save your report until you hear from me, sir. The governor reached for pen and ink. He gave the completed letter to the Lone Ranger, as well as a map showing the location of Colburn's headquarters. With these in his pocket, the masked man returned to Tonto. Where we go now, Chief Harvey? To see Ross Colburn and his friends, Tonto. He reached the living fellow. One, two, three. Get him up. It was mid-afternoon of the next day when a sentry halted the Lone Ranger and Tonto at the entrance to a valley near Mule Jaw Mountain. Oh, 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 Don't try reaching for your gun. Where's Ross Colburn? What do you want? I'll discuss that with him. Will you take me to him or... Or what? I'll find him without your help. Mister, you're local if you think you can get past me. I'm here to keep the lights of you out of this valley. As the sentry spoke, the masked man pressed his knees against Silver's sides. The great horse quickly moved forward. Surprised, the sentry momentarily took his eyes from the masked man and the Indian and watched the gallant stallion. In that instant, the Lone Ranger's hands flashed to his holsters. A moment later, he fired his left gun. The sentry stared in dismay at his own useless weapon. Sorry to smash your gun, but I've no time to waste answering questions. Take us to Colburn. That shot will alert every man in camp. That's all right with me. Get moving. You'll never get out of here alive. Move. Uh, follow me. I want to the Lone Ranger holstered his guns as the disarmed sentry led the way through the valley entrance. Rounding a bend in the trail, they saw a group of armed men coming toward them. Colburn and his three friends were in the lead. Where's the man to arrest you? Get out of here, come in here. You're covered. Quiet. Quiet down, boys. Colburn, I'm here to see you and your three friends. You're the Lone Ranger. That's right. Back to your tent, man. This man, the engine of freight. Oh, hey, the Lone Ranger. Why didn't you say so, mister? You didn't ask for identification. Go back to your post, Slim. Right, boss. Mister, we never had a chance to thank you for helping us out in Kansas. We were damn right grateful to you for helping us get our cattle through. I'm glad I was able to help you. Easy, said me. How'd you and your engine pal find this valley? The governor told us where you were. Uh, how come? Coburn, let's go into your tent. We have a lot to talk about. Colburn and his friends led the way through an army tent. Tonto stood guard outside, while the Lone Ranger told the four veterans that the authorities were aware of their activities. They know the location of this headquarters, and they know your plans. Thanks for the warning, mister. Now that we know they're wired to us, we'll move carefully. You intend to go ahead? You're a doggone right. Jeff Stewart were alive. He'd map strategy to draw the Yankees clean out of the Southwest. Stewart's dead. That's Mosby. Maybe You're he... talking about subordinate officers. Mm hmm you're entirely forgetting the greatest general of them all. Wow. The man who led the Confederate Army. You mean... I mean Robert E. Lee. Robert E. If General Lee will take command... Why not ask him what he thinks of your plan? Where would we find him? I'll take you to him. Will your men remain here until we return? But they'll stay here till doomsday if they think the general's coming back to lead them. <laughs> Eager for the sight of their old commander, the four veterans quickly prepared for the long journey with the masked man and Tonto. Leaving orders with the men who were to remain in the valley, Ross asked, Are you fellas all set? Okay. Yes, sir. And let's travel. Come on, get in. Get in. The 
Riders traveled at a ground-covering lope, and during the long trip, the Lone Ranger and Tonto found the ex-soldiers good companions. Avoiding towns and settlements, where the Lone Ranger's mask would be questioned, they rode steadily. As they moved into the state of Virginia, the men became grim and silent. They were not far from the battlefields where many of their comrades had fallen. We'll reach Lexington tonight. That's where we'll find General Lee? Yes. Here, come on, come on, come on. Come on. After nine o'clock that evening, when they reached the vicinity of Washington College in Lexington, Virginia, they drew rein a short distance from the college buildings. Oh, 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 oh. While the four veterans studied the moonlit landscape, the Lone Ranger took the governor's letter from his pocket and handed it to Tonto. Tonto, will you take this letter to General Lee and ask him if he'll meet us here? Oh, where may find him? He'll be in the college president's house. You'll have to ask directions to it. Oh, he's savvy. Come, Scout. Come, Tonto. Dear... You think you've come to meet us, mister? We'll have to wait and see. The men dismounted and stood beside their horses, waiting for Tonto to return. Five minutes passed. Ten minutes. And then the sound of hoops broke the quiet of the college surroundings. At length, two riders came into view. They recognized Tonto. But the hat brim obscured the face of the other horseman. Can it be? There was something familiar about the gait of the handsome gray horse and an unmistakable dignity about the man in the saddle. Suddenly, Ross Colburn reached for his hat. As he removed it, he murmured, Boys, it's Marshal Rob. It's Uncle Bob. General. General Lee. Oh, oh. The rider who brought the beloved war horse traveler to a halt in the moonlit clearing was no ordinary man. For no ordinary man could have inspired the blind loyalty of men like Stonewall Jackson, Jeb Stewart, A.P. Hill, and countless other brave soldiers. Robert E. Lee was a great man. And as the Lone Ranger met him for the second time in his career, he knew that he had made no mistake in reuniting the four veterans with their old commander. The general's voice was warm and friendly when he spoke to the masked man. We've met before, sir. I wasn't sure you'd remember the meeting, General Lee. I do remember. You did me a great service in the West years ago. I'm glad to see you again. Thank you, sir. Well, gentlemen, what may I do for you? Captain Ross Colburn, 43rd Battalion, Virginia Cavalry, reporting for duty, General. Duty, Captain Colburn? That's right, sir. My friends and I are here to offer our services. We've accumulated guns, ammunition, supplies, and a hundred ex-soldiers who are ready to go on with the fight. Ross spoke eagerly, but the general listened in silence. We've only a hundred men now. But if we can go back to Texas and say that you'll lead us, we'll be able to muster an army of thousands. So that's why you're here. We've come all the way from Texas to ask you to lead us again. We weren't out fought the last time, General Lee. And with luck, sir... I know we weren't out fought, Captain. No man ever fought better than those who stood by me. We'll lick the Yankees for sure this time. Gentlemen, the disputed matters between the North and South were decided by war. We must abide by that decision. I gave my word, gentlemen. But can't sure. be. But, but, sir, we, we were never a battle in the South fought. We came to... You were good soldiers, loyal soldiers... But your duty now is to unite in an honest effort to obliterate the effect of war and restore the blessings of peace to our land. Peace, sir? Yes. Promote harmony and good feeling. Qualify yourselves to vote. And then elect to the state and general legislatures wise and patriotic men who will devote their abilities to the interests of the country and the healing of dissension. I have invariably recommended this course since the cessation of hostilities. And I've endeavored to practice it myself. But, but what about us? We've worked to build up an armed force. We've got supplies and men who are ready to fight. We're waiting for orders. Gentlemen, I earnestly hope that you will abandon your animosities and make your sons Americans.
Later that night, the four veterans were traveling west. They had been silent and thoughtful until Ross suddenly missed the masked man who had been traveling with them. Where's the Lone Ranger? He said he had to send a telegram to the governor of Texas. He and Tonto will join us later. Uh, well, boys, we have a lot to do when we get home. We'll have to disband the men, divide the weapons and the food, and head back to our ranches to try to build them up again. I never expected things to turn out this way. I think the masked man knew how they'd turn out. Huh? What do you mean, Ross? I don't think General Lee's advice was any surprise to the Lone Ranger. George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Muir Incorporated, directed by Charles D. Livingston, and edited by Franz Stryker. The part of the Lone Ranger is played by Brace Beamer. Beamer.